-hmm. Welcome to Bible study this evening. Braden and I were working on the roof together, and he asked me, I think three times today, when are we going to do the Bible lesson? So, very happy to see young men who are eager to take time to study God's Word. That makes me happy, and it makes the Heavenly Father even more happy. Alright, so let's pray before we begin our study. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have given us this time and this place to study your Word. We are asking that you will speak to our hearts and our minds, that you will teach us. We're asking that Satan will be driven out and away, that you would keep him far from us, that this recording would be covered with your protection, so that others can learn and follow along in your word. We ask this in the name of your son, Yeshua. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are on our family Bible lesson, year one, quarter two, and we're on lesson one, Rebecca. Our memory verse is Psalm chapter 31 and verse 3. And it reads, For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. And we have a scripture song for part of the verse. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Psalm 31, verse 3. The character quality that we are going to be emphasizing is courtesy. What is courtesy? Courtesy is elegance or politeness of manners, especially politeness connected with kindness, civility, compliance, respect. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 8 says, Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. We are going to be learning about insects. What is an insect? Different insects. Honeybees, butterflies, moths, dragonflies, grasshoppers, and ants. Okay, let's turn now in our Bibles to the book of Genesis chapter 24, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9. Genesis chapter 24, verses 1 through 9. I see pages turning in the Bible. That's good. Yes. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant in his house, that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country, and to my kindred, 
and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again unto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto thy son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master, and swear to him concerning that matter. Making Plans Abraham had become an old man, and expected soon to die. Yet one act remained for him to do in securing the fulfillment of the promise to his posterity. Isaac was the one divinely appointed to succeed him as the keeper of the law of God and the father of the chosen people. But he was yet unmarried. The inhabitants of Canaan were given to idolatry, and God had forbidden intermarriage between his people and them, knowing that such marriages would lead to apostasy. The patriarch feared the effect of the corrupting influences surrounding his son. Abraham's habitual faith in God and submission to his will were reflected in the character of Isaac. But the young man's affections were strong, and he was gentle and yielding in disposition. If united with one who did not fear God, he would be in danger of sacrificing principle for the sake of harmony. In the mind of Abraham, the choice of a wife for his son was a matter of grave importance. He was anxious to have him marry one who would not lead him from God. In ancient times, marriages, in ancient times, marriage engagements were generally made by the parents, and this was the custom among those who worshipped God. None were required to marry those whom they could not love, but in the bestowal of their affections, the youth were guided by the judgment of their experienced, God-fearing parents. It was regarded as a dishonor to parents, and even a crime, to pursue a course contrary to this. Isaac, trusting to his father's wisdom and affection, was satisfied to commit the matter to him. What would it be like if a young person that was of marriageable age would be able to trust their godly father so much that they would say, oh, you know me, you know me maybe better than I know myself. You pray about it and I'll trust you to pick a wife for me. Or if you were a daughter of a marriageable age. What would it be like if you had a godly father that you could trust and you could say, oh, you know me maybe better than I know myself. I'll trust you to pray about it and pick a husband for me. Wow. Isaac really trusted his dad. Isaac was satisfied to commit the matter to him, 
believing also that God himself would direct in the choice made. When we're considering marriage, do we need God himself to direct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So many people have years or a lifetime of regret because they did not ask God himself to direct in this matter of marriage. The Patriarch's thoughts turned to his father's kindred in the land of Mesopotamia. Though not free from idolatry, they cherished the knowledge and worship of the true God. Isaac must not leave Canaan to go to them, but it might be that among them could be found one who would leave her home and unite with him in maintaining the pure worship of the living God. Abraham committed the important matter to his eldest servant, a man of piety, experience, and sound judgment who had rendered him long and faithful service. He required this servant to make a solemn oath before the Lord that he would not take a wife for Isaac of the Canaanites, but would choose a maiden from the family of Nahor in Mesopotamia. He charged him not to take Isaac thither. If a damsel could not be found who would leave her kindred, then the messenger would be released from his oath. The patriarch encouraged him in his difficult and delicate undertaking with the assurance that God would crown his mission with success. The Lord God of heaven, he said, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, he shall send his angel before thee. Abraham's servant showed him great courtesy. How? By being polite and by kindly agreeing to help find Isaac a wife. He respected his master. The hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. Could someone explain to me what a hoary head is? A hoary head is, in other words, someone who, whose head shows their age. So if you see someone with really white hair or gray hair, you know what about their age. If you see someone that has really gray hair or really white hair, do you think that they're a young person? No. No. Do you think that they're an old person? Yes. Yes. Okay, so hoary head just means like gray hair or white hair. Someone who their, their head or their hair shows their age. So the hoary head is what kind of crown? Crown of glory. Mm. The hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. So the world looks at gray hair and says, ooh, that looks awful. And so they take these caustic chemicals and dye the hair, which is number one, expensive, and number two, unhealthy. And old people dye their hair so they don't want to look old. They don't want to show their, their age. But according to biblical principles and culture, this is a crown of glory. You see this old gray hair. And in biblical culture, the younger generation can say, Oh, that man or that woman, they have wisdom. Because they've been walking with God for longer than I have as a young person. Mm, I should go to them and ask them for advice or input. 
I should ask them to give me some counsel. And so you know who has this crown of glory and because you look at the hair. But if all the hoary heads in the church dye their hair, then you won't see any crowns of glory. And you might not know who you should go to for your counsel or your advice. So if you're an old person, embrace your hoary head as a crown of glory. Don't spend money dyeing it or spend time. Just embrace it that God is giving you a visible crown of glory. And those younger generation who are seeking to know God's will in their life, they will see that crown of glory and they will honor you. The king would wear a crown as a visible sign that he has authority. He's worthy of authority and leadership. So old people who, who are walking with God, who have walked for years with God, wear your crown of glory. Thank God for it. The hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 31. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 32 says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. How can we follow this principle today? So maybe, maybe you're a young person and you're sitting down in your home or at your friend's home. When an old person comes with their hoary head and they come inside, you should rise up and shake their hand and say welcome. Don't just sit there and ignore them. Stand up as a symbol of respect. Okay, we have some review questions. But first, before we do our review questions, let's go back to Genesis chapter 24 and read a few verses to refresh our memory. Genesis chapter 24, verses 1 through 3. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. Okay, question. Why did Abraham feel that he must make sure that Isaac had a wife? He was getting old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and well stricken in age. Yes. So before Abraham died, he wanted to see his son Isaac happily married. Uh, there is another reason why Abraham wanted to see, make sure that Isaac had a wife. Because he wanted to make sure that he got a wife that wasn't from the Canaanites? Yes. So there, Abraham was living in the land of Canaan, and there was Canaanite people, there was heathen people who were living close by. So Abraham had a concern that Isaac would think, oh, I need a wife. And he would see a beautiful Canaanite woman, and he would decide, oh, that's the one for me. 
Abraham had that concern. So before Abraham died, he wanted to make sure that Isaac had a wife, not from the Canaanites who could lead him away from God, but a wife that would be God's choice for him. See, there's your choice for what you want, and there's God's choice for you. And we find that 100% of the time that God gives his best to those that leave the choice with him. It's amazing to me that not only did he trust his father to pick someone, but he was willing to marry the person without even like knowing what they looked like or anything. Mm. Wow. So, yes, that's, that's, uh, we could learn from that. So, <laughs> instead of going to the dating site and looking, ooh, I want, I want to pick out of all the fish in the pond, I want the most beautiful one. Instead of just looking at their pictures, if you can't meet them in person, it would be wise to get to know them without the picture. Because their face can change. They could get in a wreck and be disfigured or over, over age. Things can change over age. Get to know them based on who they are rather than just what they look like. Yes, and they may have a beautiful heart, but it may not be reflected as much on the outward appearance. Mm. But as you get to know the heart, then you become mm. more attracted to them. That's true. So you may, you may be interested in getting married, and you may look at somebody and think, oh, he's, he's, does, he's not handsome, or she's not beautiful. And that may be your initial reaction, but... If you get to know them and their character, their heart, their morals are upright, then over time you see their inner beauty. And then as you see their inner beauty, your assessment or your impression of their physical features can actually change. That's a very good point. Second question, what does it mean to make an oath or swear? Could we just put that in different terms? The promise? Yes, that's right. So to make an oath or to swear would be to make a promise. Now, sometimes when we think of swearing, we think of like cussing, you know. Um, but uh, this word swear that we find in the King James Version would have the same meaning as to make a covenant or a promise. Yes. So why did Abraham's servant, Eliezer, why did he put his hand under his master's thigh? Well, he was told to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think it was like a sign of a promise or something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I don't understand all the reasons why. But uh, you don't normally put your hand under someone's thigh. So maybe it was just like kind of like when you're in the court and they have you hold up your right hand, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you're when you're in court and uh, judge uh, asks you, do you do you swear? Do you promise to speak the truth? Uh, and uh, if so, raise your right hand. So. When you raise your right hand, your body language is saying, yes, I promise, I swear. Um, and then your, your, your body language is matching your words, and then it sticks in your memory more. It's more significant. Insects. Learning about honeybees. A honeybee is an insect. Insects have three parts to their bodies with two compound eyes, two antenna, wings, and six legs with six joints on each. There are many kinds of bees, such as leaf-cutting bees, bumblebees, 
paper wasps, hornets, and many others. Honeybees are known for the honey they make and for their pollination of flowers. Honeybees work to produce honey. They have to visit about 2,000 flowers just to make one tablespoon of honey. 2,000 flowers just to make one tablespoon. One tablespoon. 2,000 flowers. Wow, I didn't realize that. That is a lot of flowers just to make one tablespoon. In our Bible lesson, Rebecca was willing to work hard to make a life sweeter for Eliezer and his ten camels. Each camel may drink as much as ten gallons of water at a time. There are certain things that make an insect an insect. They usually have three parts to their bodies. They usually have wings. They usually have six legs. They usually have six joints on each leg. There are certain things that make courteous children courteous. They love God like Abraham, Isaac, and Eliezer did. They respect their parents like Isaac did. They are polite and kind like Eliezer. They respect the counsel. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 31, and follow the counsel in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 32. As we work together, let's think of ways to be courteous to one another. If there's not enough chairs, for everyone to sit down, sit on the floor so an older person can have your chair. Let's look for bees and use an insect identification book for your area to learn the proper names. Let's find out more information about bees by using books and visiting beehives and flowers where bees are finding nectar. One of our assignments is to serve honey at, at a meal. Yes, we can do that. Okay. In ancient times, marriage engagements were usually made by the parents, and this was the custom among those who worshipped God. None were required to marry those whom they could not love. But in the bestowal of their affections, the youth were guided by the judgment of their experienced, God-fearing parents. It was regarded as a dishonor to parents, and even a crime, to pursue a course contrary to this. Dating is not a part of God's program for marital happiness. Shield your children from worldly literature and associations that promote the idea of boyfriends and girlfriends in the dating sense of the term. So, I would like to clarify, there is an appropriate time to go on a date and to get to know someone. But this kind of game that teenagers play, they're not ready to get married they shouldn't be thinking about getting married. They should be focusing on learning skills and education for later. But they're playing this game of boyfriend and girlfriend and they have their hearts broken and they break up and then they get back together again and then they date this one or that. And it just opens the door to a lot of temptation. If you're a parent and you have children, pray that God will show you who is the one for your child when they grow up. And keep that in prayer. And then be involved 
in this. And then if you're a young person and you're old enough to consider getting married and you have the skills necessary, you have what you need, and you feel that God is showing you that you're ready to get married, then don't just play the dating game. Ask God to show you very clearly who is the one for you. And then ask your parents to be involved if you have godly parents. And ask other godly people in your life to pray for you as well. Be open to hear people who express red flags about what they see. Um, sometimes people can see things and they're outside looking in and they can see things that we don't recognize ourselves. I'm sure that we will discuss this concept and this very important subject further as we go on in this lesson. I guess I was kind of curious what would happen if his father had died before he picked out a wife for him. Mm -hmm. Then that would be just his own mm -hmm. choosing. That's a good question. Um, I There would be a danger that the wife that Isaac would marry would be just of his own choosing. Uh, we see a contrast between Isaac and Samson. Samson said to his parents, Get me that woman. She pleases me well. So... They said, oh, no, you know, isn't there a wife among our own people that you could marry? And they told him, they cautioned him against it. But in the end, they did, and they went and got the marriage arrangements for their son. He got married, and that marriage did not last long at all. So that's a very big contrast between Isaac. Isaac saw pretty Canaanite women, but he didn't say, oh, Abraham, my father, Get me that woman. She's pretty. I want her. No, he didn't do that. He trusted that God was guiding his father. And his father commissioned Eliezer to go find the woman. Such a big difference. So, yes, you may be in a situation where you don't have godly parents. They wouldn't, they wouldn't pick a, a good wife or husband for you. In a situation where you don't have godly parents, that's more challenging, but uh, you you may be part of a fellowship of believers and there may be an older person that you can trust and you can tell them, hey, I I'm, I'm feel that God's calling me to get married. I need a spouse. Would you pray for me and maybe help me find someone? Um, and so that there's safety in that. And then it makes it harder if you don't have godly parents, but you can definitely go directly to the Father in heaven and He can, he can show you. Yes, in previous lessons we were talking about um, asking God for a sign, and mm -hmm. that's something that you can also do yes. in this situation is ask God for a sign to get confirmation mm -hmm. of if it's His will or not. Yes. There's really two questions that are more important than any other in your life. And first one is, who is my God? Question number one. Is your God money? Is your God popularity? Is your God yourself? Are you your own God and you're going to just do what seems best in your own eyes and you'll be the king of your own life? Or will the Lord Jesus Christ be the Lord of your life? And will you take His Word as your law book? Will you be an obedient citizen under the authority and the government of the King of Kings? Question number one, who is my God? Who is my King? Who do I bow down in authority to? I remember I was giving out Bible tracts one day. We were on a trip delivering some mules. I was with my friend Stephen Haste, and I was so thankful that he would always give me opportunity and time to give out Bible tracts. And so I tried to give a Bible tract to this young man. He's like, I don't need that. I don't want that. God's not real. 
And I told him, well, one day you will bow down. You'll bow your knees to the King of Kings. Because the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He said, no, I won't. And he got in his sports car and spun gravel as he was going out. And one day he'll bow. So you may choose that you yourself are your God. You'll be under nobody's authority but your own authority. But one day you will bow down to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords. People choose who their God is. I choose the Lord Jesus Christ to be my God. And I found that being a citizen of His kingdom, there's security there. There's provision there. There's guidance there. There's peace there. It's a peaceful kingdom. I have purpose as a citizen. The laws as a citizen of the King of Heaven, they're all fair and just laws. They're designed for my own safety. And when I obey the laws as a citizen of the Kingdom of Heaven, I don't hurt myself and I don't hurt other people. But the people who choose to be a God of themselves, they hurt themselves and they hurt other people. So who is your God? That's question number one. And who will you marry? If Jesus Christ is your king and you're a citizen of heaven and you obey the laws of his kingdom, then he will help you to find a, a life partner in the commitment of marriage that will help you to continue to be a citizen, an obedient citizen of the kingdom of heaven. He will guide you in that. And if you don't have question number one answered, then you're not ready for question number two. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for keeping us safe today. Thank you for Braden and his help up on the roof. Thank you for keeping us from being hurt, from slipping and falling. You are so good to us, so kind to us. Father, we ask that you would be our God and that you would give us a willing heart to obey your laws, that we could be obedient citizens of your kingdom. Bless those of us that are here and those that are watching. Thank you. We ask in the name of your Son, Jesus, Yeshua. Amen.